So of the 3,876 comments. Roughly. Roughly. <laughs> are, were they mostly constructive or what's your process to consume and reflect those? I love that question. Like, What's a high quality comment? What's a low quality uh, comment? Yeah, <laughs> you guys stink. Think, honestly, <laughs> like, I mean, we—I I don't think we got one that said we stink, but you know, we most of them are are very high quality and constructive. Like, I think people who send comments understand our process, understand that we take all these things into account. Like, and so I, I think it's they submit comments because it's important to them, and they're not going to submit comments that basically just say, "Hey, look." We don't like any of this because that's not constructive. Mm -hmm. That's a waste of their time and it's a waste of our time. You don't see a lot of trolling in the comments. <laughs> There's sometimes a little yeah. bit of trolling, but it's more of like in the tone of the comments. Okay. Normally what's being said in the comment is still very constructive and helpful. Um, but I would say the, almost all of them are, 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 are like technically constructive and helpful. Sometimes tone changes. But, but at the end of the day, like almost all of them are helpful. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad yourself. Doing great, man. We're up to this... Uh... Identity Week America Conference in Washington, D.C. It's been really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've met a few people, uh, had some really good hallway conversations, and I think the content overall has been a little bit different than my day to day. We've talked a lot of um, self sovereign identity, a lot of uh, identity verification. So exciting stuff. I mean, we talk about that within the realm of identity all the time, but it's real focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a good conference. We're in D.C. Uh, so far, the worst thing that has happened is that we tried to go for chicken and waffles last night, as I have been planning all day at Yardbird. And, of course, we're next to a convention center. So somebody had bought out the place. Actually, a couple of people had bought out the place. There was, like, two different things. And I was absolutely crushed last night about 7 p.m. when I had been thinking about chicken and waffles all day, and it didn't happen. So guess what's happening tonight? Chicken and waffles. As long as, there, as, long as there's no... Like buying out of yard bird again. Yeah, if, if that happens, uh, I'll be very disappointed. Um, yeah, so Identity Week, we're here at the One America. Uh, so thanks to those who have helped get us here. Uh, companies like RSM, who sponsor us to get out here and bring this kind of content to you. Uh, definitely the Identity Week uh, folks who are helping us you know, get set up here with a space to record and inviting us in. Um, I did a panel yesterday on the future of, or actually it was navigating the future of identity access management. So... We had people from Adobe, Swiss Bits, uh, Northwestern Mutual, TD Bank. We had a really kind of cool panel kind of pontificating on the future. Yeah, I know you were in the audience. I was in the uh, audience. There were Star Trek references, drop, deep cuts. That was, that was deep cut, man. <laughs> that was like specific episode, season four, episode number two. Uh, Even the episode name. Even like, the episode name, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my new friend, Ben. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. And it was, it was a lot of good times. So it's been good. I think, you know, been able to get out here, see people and make connections and do all that kind of stuff. So, and you've become quite the MC. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm mm -hmm. still figuring it out as I go on. Every time is a new time. I've done a handful now. So I'm starting to kind of figure things out, but yeah, I seem to, I seem to be the MC type of role quite a bit, which is fine with me. I think it's easy because it's not like, I'm on the spotlight or having to present anything. It's like, hey, and here's Jim. He's the really smart one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like on podcast. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, shout out to RSM. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, if you're going to Identity Week Asia, that is still coming up, I think, in October in Singapore, IDAC 3.0. You get a discount for that. And so thanks for showing, showing support for the show for that. And uh, yeah, why don't we get to it today? Because we've got a guest. He's actually been on the show before. He is Ryan Galuzzo. He's the Identity Management Program Lead at NIST. Welcome back to the show, Ryan. Thanks for having me again. I'm excited to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I know you spoke yesterday, and we're going to get into this a little bit, but you were with us about 50-ish episodes ago, 256. And so I'm not going to make you rehash Sodium for Identity origin story, but what's new? 
what's been happening in the last what's new and what's been happening yeah. um so i have to be honest i'm terrified to listen to my own voice so i didn't actually listen to the episode so i don't know if i can remember everything that we talked about but you know the big things that i would say the two big things that we've kind of subsequently announced um since then and actually in just past couple of weeks um one we have a uh a mobile driver's license project that's going on within the national Cybersecurity center of excellence um, I don't remember if we talked about this previously, but basically the NCCOE is a place where we bring COTS product providers, technology providers, um, government partners, industry partners together to actually do real builds um, that are based on international and, and, uh, and NIST standards. So essentially we've, we've brought together a pretty comprehensive team that's going to focus on um, demonstrating the use of a mobile driver's license or verifiable credential. Um, in online workflows. So we've seen a lot of work being done by like TSA and other organizations that are really heavily focused on how do we solve for presentation of something like a mobile driver's license in person. Uh, we wanted to take that to the next level and really start to look at how do we do this in an online scenario? How does it support things like um, identity proofing and verification steps that that we typically yeah. use, um, you know, like a, a driver's mm -hmm. license, physical driver's license, document auth and capture for now. Can we potentially use this to replace that in the future? and even gain more confidence in it. So hmm. we've got some issuers, uh, we've got a couple of wallet providers on board right now. Um, we've got an underlying identity and access management infrastructure, and then we got a whole bunch of financial institutions. And so our first use case is really focused on how do we show how we can use these things in a um, customer onboarding process that is aligned to the customer identification program requirements, also known as like KYC. Um, so we, we announced that. I'm not gonna attempt to list all of the participants that we have, because I will forget one and, and then be people upset. will be mad yeah. at me. <laughs> but let's just say we have a very robust set of, of partners, including some really important financial institutions, um, some very big players in the space, as well as some of the smaller companies and organizations that are that are really looking to make some innovative steps there. Um, so that's that's one big thing, you know, that the next phases on that after we get this bill done will be a government service use case um, and then a, a, a healthcare service uh, use case. Um, so big announcement on that. The other big announcement is we released our second public comment draft of HR 63 revision four. And I think we'll probably talk a little bit more detail about that as we go along. But um, in December of 22 is when we put out the first public comment draft. Um, we, uh, we subsequently had a 119 day public comment period, which is actually really long. Most of these are about like 45 to 90 days, sometimes even less. Um, but we wanted to have a very targeted outreach plan that went with it to make sure that we were getting feedback from organizations that we don't always get feedback from. Mm -hmm. So members of the, uh, you know, like the civil society space, academia, state and local. So we went on a whirlwind tour to try and uh, to try and get as much feedback as we could there. Uh, and it worked. Uh, we got, uh, I think it was about 130, 140 organizations that submitted um, gigantic lists of comments. And once we broke those down, we had about 3,876 not about, we had exactly 3,000. <laughs> about, eight, that seems pretty, roughly, yeah, yeah. very, very oddly precise. Um, there was a decimal point in yeah, there, I'm yeah. not sure where that. Uh, we are NIST, <laughs> you got to be as accurate as possible. So yeah, 3,876 comments. Um, and we basically spent the, the last, better part of the last year kind of breaking those down, um, you know, figuring out what makes sense to keep and what makes sense not to keep and and uh, and releasing the update. And and we, we really decided early on, I think we actually announced last August that we just, there was just too much going on in this space to not do a second public comment draft. So based upon the fact that we got so many comments, we're gonna make pretty substantial changes and the fact that there's a lot of standards out there that are still evolving in this space, pass keys, mm -hmm. mobile driver's license, wallets. There's still a lot that has changed even since when we started this process a year ago. So um, we decided we really need to have that second public comment period and, and validate a lot of what we changed. So. That's where we're at right now. I think both of those were, they were released on back-to-back -back days about two weeks ago. Um, so it's been a very, very busy period for us. So when I asked you what's going on, not much. Sounds nothing, like nothing mm -hmm. at all. Kind of run of the mill yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. We're here at any week. Let's start here. How's the conference been going for you so far? I know you spoke yesterday. Yeah, spoke yesterday, talked on a panel um, focused on the big question of cross-border interoperability, um, you know, and some of the work we're doing in international standard space. So work we're doing to support ISO, work we're doing with W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, um, FIDO Alliance, and how we kind of tie some of the underlying technical protocols together to at least support, hey, I can share this information, 
Um, and then talking about how like 863 fits in from like a, a framework perspective and assurance level perspective to help convey the almost, almost policy type things of should I accept this credential? So, um, it was a good panel. Uh, thought it, thought it went really well. Um, but you know, I was on it, so I guess I'm a little bit partial. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't got to as many sessions as I would have liked, um, because I did have a couple of those side things that I had to deal with. But I, I think one of the things I like most about this conference is the fact that like it brings people to me. Mm -hmm. Speaking selfishly again, <laughs> um, you know, it's not often we get a, a pretty big comprehensive um, identity conference here in DC. So the fact that, you know, we get to see a lot of vendors that we don't necessarily get to see on a regular basis. We get to learn about what innovations are coming out of the technology space right now. Uh, and we get to meet with a lot of folks that otherwise we'd have to you know, connect with on Zoom, it gives us a really good chance for some face-to-face -face, um, and a lot of really interesting vendors and technology opportunities as well, too. So um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a great it's a great chance for us to, to, to engage with folks that otherwise, you know, might be hard to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember walking through the vendor hall yesterday with Jim and, you know, I recognize maybe a quarter of the vendors that were there. And like, there's just, there's a lot. There's so many vendors. There's a lot in this space. A lot of vendors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of innovation going on. I think that's one of the things that's pretty cool is like you get to see, you know, and it's not all one set of products. Like sometimes you go to conferences like this and it's like 350 biometrics vendors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's super useful if that's really what you want to see. But you got a nice diverse set of, uh, of, of vendors that you can check out here covering things from DACA to biometrics to wallets to, um, you know, to even some folks that do, doing stuff in like the, the trust frameworks out of the house. Mm -hmm. too. I know Jim wants to talk about uh, NIST 863. Before I get to that, though, I just want to ask you a question. The panel I had yesterday was about navigating the future of IAM, and the topic of self sovereign identity came up. And this whole idea of being in charge of your own account, right, or things like that. And my thought process was, okay, that sounds cool. I've heard about that for a while now, um, but I don't see it yet happening in the real world. I feel like this is still kind of the future. Where do you see things like self-sovereign identity coming through? Because here's, here's my point, is at one point during the talk, when I was moderating the panel, I actually asked the audience, like, who would you trust to run this decentralized platform that would need to be in place of this? You know, the government, nobody raised their hand. <laughs> you know, financial institutions, nobody raised their hands. Education, still nothing. Yeah. Medical, still nothing. Like there's a there's a trust thing there that people, at least in that room, were not willing to trust a large entity like that to run it. I'm just curious, where do you see SSI? So I mean SSI is tough because it's as a term, it's got a lot of like preconceived notions and concepts and very strong opinions like on both sides of it, right? Like I mean, it, as a pure concept, I think it, it sounds really cool but the trust component of it becomes very, very hard, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, organizational trust that needs to go into these things. There's a lot of risk management that needs to go into how you're going to accept and where you're going to accept an identity. And that's still kind of an open question a lot of times with SSA. I think there's a lot of trust placed in the protocols and the technology and the cryptography. But at the end of the day, there's, you know, there's still questions of the verification process the authentication process and, and the proofing and the issuance. And there's a lot of stuff that kind of starts to compound. That being said, I think like the core concepts of providing greater control to the end user is, it's a no brainer, right? Like these are things we should all be working towards to the greatest degree possible. And I think that's something that, that we're starting to see take a little bit more um, of a front seat in, in some of these concepts. I mean, whether you're talking mobile driver's license, whether you're talking about verifiable credentials, whether you're talking about the European digital identity wallets, there is definitely a move where you're abstracting some of the control that had historically been maintained by like, you know, a server sitting at a government service and you're putting that control into the end user's hands. Now, I don't think that's truly self-sovereign, but it is, it is abstracting and at least pulling some of that control into that user's, into that user's possession. And they're able to say, I'm going to present this here. I'm going to present this there. It's going to be mine. You know, there's there's a degree of at least control that I think gets increased there. Again, I don't think it's truly self-sovereign. I don't know if anybody in like the mm -hmm. self-sovereign identity world would would believe that those are self-sovereign. But I think they're a move generally in the right direction to be able to grant more control to end users. And I think particularly once we start to see wallets that are able to maintain you know, more than one credential, mm -hmm. um, you're going to see people be able to add credentials, attributes, things that are verifiable about themselves that aren't 
that aren't necessarily like, you know, a government controlled document, right? Like not a, not an MDOC from a, you know, a DMV, but like, Hey, this is an assertion of, you know, um, my credentials as a, as a professional, or this is an assertion of, of, um, some other status about myself that is less centralized and, you know, requires less tie back to some kind of authority that starts to kind of blur those lines a little bit. So I think the move in that direction is, is very positive. And, you know, NIST is obviously encouraging, you know, as much user control as possible with the understanding that there's degrees of trust, particularly on the government side that you have to have confidence in, um, that you're not always going to get like in a pure SSI model. Now there's probably SSI people who are going to listen to this and be upset with me about making some of those statements, but, but we deal in the real world. Yeah. Right? These are yeah. things that we have to solve for. And specifically we deal, I deal with like government and, mm -hmm. and having trust in the authority that issued some kind of identity verification, some kind of credential, some kind of process is very important for managing risk and also making sure like, you know, we have a responsibility to protect people's data. Mm -hmm. And we have to be good stewards of it. And so being able to kind of understand what risks you're incurring by accepting a specific type of credential, you can only get that with, with having some knowledge of where it originated. Mm -hmm. I think this topic deserves its own episode. I'd love that to come back and talk about it. Um, one thing I just want to start with, it seems like you've really loved your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I, I do really like my job a lot. Um, I think it's, uh, it's got its own challenges, but like the breadth of people that I get exposed to and ideas and concepts uh, is really, really cool. Um, and there's a certain degree of, of, of being at like the center of some of these conversations that I like, or, or, I just really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, not everyone loves us all the time. <laughs> sure. um, and that is, that is difficult because I do like to be liked. Um, but you know, what's it's, the biggest criticism that, that you think NIST gets? <laughs> It's, it's tough because it depends. Like, I, th I think there's a couple different ways to look at our guidance. Um, and some people yeah. see it mostly as a security document. Other people want to see it more as like a, an enabling document of like, Hey, this is how I can offer more services. You know, there's the, the, the kind of perennial debate between how much risk do I accept versus how much, um, risk do I, I focus on from a compliance perspective. And so there's, you know, we might make a change that we think supports like a broader accessibility issue and people might push back and say, well, you might be slackening security a little bit there. And a lot of times, you know, we try and address that by providing as many pathways as possible to be able to successfully complete like identity proofing or authentication. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, I don't think we're ever going to satisfy everyone. Um, and the biggest thing is we're like, we don't want to focus on compliance. That, that would be a, 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 most people want us to be about compliance. We actually want the documents, we want our guidance, we want the tools we provide to be something that agencies can use to manage risk mm -hmm. in the best way possible. Because at the end of the day, you're always going to have to accept risk. You're always going to have to deal with risk and you're always going to have to be able to do it in a way that's most informed as possible. So we like to see what we provide as a baseline that organizations have the ability to adapt to their, you know, to their, their space. But there's a lot of people who want to view it as a conformance document and to an extent it can be that as well too. And so it's a tough battle sometimes, yeah. but, um, the key word there seems to be it's guidance. So it's it, not yeah. the law. <laughs> well, right. it's definitely not a lie. It, it is like our guidance is mandated by federal policy for federal agencies, but that's the reason like, you know, we have the entire first volume mm -hmm. is about risk management, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, and one of the big changes we, we made in revision four, um, back in December and that we're, we're emphasizing even more now is we've opened the aperture a little bit more for flexibility for agencies to be able to make trade-offs between different I mean, risk types when they actually do their implementation. Yeah. So um, it's less about rigidly saying, if this, then that, I'm IL2, and that's yeah. the only option that I have to implement. Yeah. This conference is largely focused on the public sector, yeah. but there is a, a good share of private sector as well. One of the things I've really been, I shouldn't say surprised by, but that I've noticed over the years is that um, NIST is also heavily followed and heavily aligned to from a private sector perspective. Do you guys keep that in mind as you're developing these papers or is that just a secondary concern? No, absolutely. I mean, yes, our primary audience and consumers are the U.S. federal government because they have to implement what we, what we put out. Um, but we very much take into account the broader ecosystem. And we also take into account that people turn and look to it. Um, 
I think the benefit that the commercial space has is they can kind of pick and choose where they want to apply certain things. Um, and that's, that's not really a problem for us as well too, right? Like ideally if we're all using the same baselines and talking about the same concepts and using the same, um, the same paradigms, it's much easier to communicate amongst ourselves about what we're doing, what we're not doing. Um, so we do take that in mind. We take, we take feedback from everyone. So, I mean, of the 3,876 comments that we got, roughly, roughly, (laughs) give or take, um, 70% 70% of them came from commercial entities. Now, there's an overlap there of commercial entities that are also providing services to the federal government or consulting for the federal government. But, you know, we got a very broad range of, of feedback. Like, you know, we had gambling sites providing feedback to us this time around too. So it's, we take feedback from everywhere. And, and honestly, we want to make sure we're, we're bringing in best practices and leading practices and security controls and accessibility controls from everyone because the U.S. government doesn't know how to do it better than anyone else. Mm. We all learn from each other and we're all going to be able to, to leverage certain kinds of concepts together. And that's why we, that's why we do it, right? It, it's about, you know, NIST does not know absolutely everything and we are not infallible. And because of that, we try to have a process that is transparent, open, and brings in the best from all across both industry and government. Um, now, it's turned around into guidance that's mandatory for the federal government, but, you know, it's, it's really something that's kind of a community contribution community effort right so of the 3,876 comments roughly roughly <laughs> are were they mostly constructive or what's your process to consume and reflect those i love that question like what's a high quality comment or what's a low quality uh, comment yeah <laughs> you got it honestly <laughs> like i mean we i don't think we got one that said we stink but you know we <laughs> Most of them are, are very high quality and constructive. Like, I think people who send comments understand our process, understand that we take all these things into account. Like, and so I, I think it's, they submit comments because it's important to them. And they're not going to submit comments that basically just say, hey, look, we don't like any of this because that's not constructive. Mm-hmm. That's a waste of their time. And it's a waste of our time. You don't see a lot of trolling in the comments. <laughs> There's sometimes a little yeah. <laughs> bit of trolling, but it's more of like in the tone of the comments. Okay. Normally what's being said in the comment is still very constructive and helpful. Um, but I would say the, almost all of them are, 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 are like technically constructive and helpful. And sometimes tone changes. But, but at the end of the day, like almost all of them are helpful. Um, you know, but they'll also range from anything like, hey, y'all forgot a comma on this page to, hey, you know, y'all didn't explain this you know, public key encryption process correctly. Mm. Um, so there's there's a very broad range of like what the comments focus on, um, but they're I mean they are almost all constructive and um, and I think because of the fact that we opened the doors so much this time around, we got a lot of really really good feedback, like really good feedback this time. Um, what does a synthesis pro- uh, process look like to take three thousand eight hundred and seventy six comments roughly? To take all that data, do you, is there like we put them in a hat, we shake it <laughs> we up, shake it up, a word dump cloud, it on the floor? Like, <laughs> um, no, do you, do you do you bucket them into like yeah. different areas? Yes. So, and, so what we do is we we kind of get the initial set of comments and we triage them and we classify them. We use GitHub to do this, so um, we we make them all issues within GitHub. Um, and then we we give them like tags. So we'll say you know this comment is editorial, like you know you spelled your name wrong or something like that, or your name appears twice on 63A, which it currently does in the draft of 63A. Um, you know, so we'll bucket them into like, hey, here's like the editorial stuff. Um, here's the stuff that's that's kind of more substantive. Uh, and then we'll go in and further triage those and say, hey, look, you know, these are things that are like red, red lines for us that we just, you know, we can't do like, hey, tell everyone they have to submit, you know, uh, their fingerprints through the FBI in order to get identity proof to whatever. Um, you know, like <laughs> the things that are just not going to happen. And then we'll have the things that we, we know we need to have some kind of internal debate on. We'll also typically have tags for like, hey, this comment seems really valuable, but we don't totally understand it. We need to go have a conversation with someone. So we'll, we'll tag some things for follow up. And then we just start working our way down the list. We have, you know, we have teams that support, um, we have contractor support that, that are all like our, um, our editors and stuff like that. They're fantastic, fantastic team. And they'll be responsible for each volume and we'll work our way through all the comments for each one. I and mean, that's why it took a really long time to get through all of those. Um, and we'll just kind of check them off as we go. The one thing we do often find ourselves in a tough place on is like, you know, we'll, we'll have a conversation. We'll be like, yes, we're going to accept this comment. And then we'll get all the way down here. We'll be like, nah, we're not going to accept this one. And as we start to write, we're like, wait a minute, 
it was the same comment. And at one point we thought we were going to do it. And then, so we have to do almost like, you know, like an initial round of vetting and then we follow through. And then as we start to write and we start to make sure we've ca captured all the items we want to capture, sometimes we have some additional debates. But, you know, I think the good news with this was there was some really good bucketing that we could do. So we were actually able to, um, in August of last year, like the really big picture items where we had a lot of really common comments um, in our initial assessment, we were able to provide um, an update. It was, it was a year ago in August that basically said, here's the things we think we're going to do. Like based upon the initial huge buckets of feedback, not like all the little ones, but like the, hey, here's the five major ones. This is what we think we're going to do. And we were able to get some initial feedback on it. Um, so I think that was... I think it was really helpful for us to do. We've done that in the past on other uh, special publications as well, too. But that gave us a chance to like vet some of our initial gut instincts and, and share some of the initial planned uh, direction we were going to take. Is it clear now what the timeline is? So you updated the dry off. Can you, <laughs> do you have to have another public comment period and then no. another revision period? Like when does this thing stop? And you never. Have... It just keeps going. For just keeps no. going, right? Um, no, it's like so, identity. Yeah. <laughs> so so we will we will not we will most likely not be doing an additional public comment period. I'm not going to say no because sure there could be something that causes it um but the intent is 45 days public comment period closes on october 7th um and then we will do the final um depending upon how many comments we have sometime after that i i, I think we'd like to see it um sometime early next year but but it's a cycle will, right and, it's, then, and then it starts over again or we, we well, it, it will start over again eventually so um like we will probably what we'll probably do is We'll let it out, we'll get it final, and then we'll start to collect like some initial feedback as implementers put it in place. And then probably a year, two years, depending upon how things are going, we'll do a couple of sensing sessions. Hey, do we need to open this back up again? Are there any major changes? Um, and then we'll make a decision about whether we're going to do another revision or not. Uh, and we'll probably do that on an iterative cycle based upon like what we're observing in the in the broader community. I kind of refer to 800-63 as kind of like the Bible for our industry. So can you kind of co cover what we can expect to see in this update? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the big things are, um, so we're just doing more of what we did in, in when we released the draft in December of 22. Um, so, you know, we, in, for example, in the base volume, we went away from this kind of, some people really loved them. This is actually one of the more controversial things, but like we had these flow charts in 63 in the base volume where the risk management section was. Um, and, and a lot of people like loved the fact that they could be like, I'm going to answer all these questions going to tell me exactly what a share is able to be at. And there's something to be said for that. We also heard from a lot of people who were like, I am hamstrung by the fact that this says I have to be here and I want to do better risk management to be able to say, look, I, I'm going to, I'm going to accept some risk or manage some risk. And it, it puts me in a very difficult position from a compliance perspective. So we wanted to kind of take the two concepts of being able to have flexibility, but still having some kind of structure. So in, in that December update, we, we basically shifted away from those kind of more structured line down the middle end up where you're supposed to end up to, to more of a process oriented approach, something akin to what's in the risk management framework. We actually was inspired by the risk management framework. So it's basically got a set of steps and processes, um, you know, starting with like, you know, identifying your insurance level, um, doing a tendering process to understand, do I need to maybe adapt this and documenting it, all that stuff, do your impact assessment. Um, so we basically added one additional step to that. So a lot of people basically gave feedback of how do we make sure we're kind of setting the context correctly here? How do we make sure we're getting all the right information? So we've you know, it, folks who are familiar with like 853 in the RMF, they talk about like the step zero, where you like get all the information you actually need. So we've added an additional step into the base volume in the risk management section that says like, define what this application is that you're protecting, understand all the users that you're going to have, because what we were also worried about and heard feedback was people are going to think because I have one user who is at AAL2, IAL2, whatever it might be, all my users need to be there. Well, that's not necessarily true, right? Because you can have administrative users who have a different risk profile than your public facing users that have a different profile than, you know, your your government employees who are accessing the back end or something like that. So there's a lot of different 
assurance levels that one application might have based upon what the user is actually doing. So we wanted to make sure we better set that context and said, hey, look, you can you can actually like think more discreetly about where to apply the assurance levels. It's not a blanket. If app is at this level, then everyone who comes near it has to be at this level. Um, the other thing we did, I laughed at that. Um, just because like, I could see a lot of people in the private sector, especially being like sub zero, get information about the app. Like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Can't do that. Don't have that. Yeah. That's going to take mean, six months. Yeah. And, but, but I mean, that is, and I think the, the, the important thing to remember is that like identity systems don't exist for the sake of having an identity system. They're protecting or enabling access to something. Right. Um, so you need to understand what that thing is mm -hmm. um, right. in order to make the right decisions about what to put in place to, to protect it. The other big thing we did was, you know, we had in, again, in the draft that we released in December, we talked about continuous evaluation and improvement. Um, this is the, the last step in that kind of risk management process. And people were like, we, we love this, but you wrote like one and a half paragraphs on it. And we don't really know exactly what we should be monitoring, evaluating. Um, we got a lot of really great comments on this, like really great comments. Um, and so what, we have, what we've done now is we've taken that section, expanded a little bit more on like the how, the relationships you need to establish, et cetera, and then focused on a set of recommended metrics. I do not have them all memorized because <laughs> I think we got about 20 in there. But this is, you know, we, people were basically, what are the things we should be paying attention to to know if we're meeting our outcomes and objectives? Um, and not all of them are identity specific data elements, but you know, looking at things that's like failure rates, pass rates, um, fraud rates, like confirmed fraud rates, um, looking at things like the types of authenticators being used, um, where you're having challenges in the process. So like where you're getting calls to your help desk saying, I cannot get through this process. If it's one person, it's one thing. If half the people calling your help desk are calling about the exact same step in your identity process, you probably have something you need to address. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those things require you to have relationships with components that are not your identity team, right? You need to have a relationship with your call center. You need to have a relationship with your fraud team. You need to have a relationship with your UX teams that are doing these things. So um, we don't mandate all of those require, all of those, those metrics get collected. What we do say is like, you should be collecting these if you can. And if you can't, you should be starting to establish those relationships to be able to pull it in. Cause not everyone's going to have that same level of maturity, I think out of the bat mm -hmm. um, or out of the box rather, but, but like a lot of those metrics were things that people recommended directly to us. Like, Hey, this is what we've been collecting and this is why it's been helpful for us. And so I think that's been, you know, those are some of the best comments I think we got on the, on the overall. Doctor. The recommendation is to collect those things to what yeah. end to prevent um, or to identify fraudulent access. That's one thing, right? So it can be, Hey, you know, we're, we are tying in where successful fraud has come through your system tying it back into your identity management team and saying, we need to fix something because you're not stopping this. You're not stopping that your doc off isn't working and, and fake documents are getting through whatever it might be. So that there's that feedback cycle from a, a security perspective, but it's not just security, right? Like it can very much be, we're losing a lot of people from a, an accessibility perspective because something in the identity system is broken, right? Like, your password reset is terrible. Your, um, your, your, your biometric is not performing the way you thought it was going to. Your doc auth isn't getting the performance or, or everyone's confused about the instructions. Like it can be very, it doesn't even have to be technical. It can be things like user experience. Kind yeah. Of stuff. Users are taking the you know, pictures of the, their documents at the wrong angle, or it's too dark. Like mm -hmm. you need to add cues to help people understand. Cause there's a lot of stuff that like you can have a fully compliant system that is absolutely terrible. Absolutely 100%. terrible. So, so the, the goal here is to focus less on I'm compliant, let's move on. It's, all right, I've built a system. How do I continue to make this most secure I can possibly make it? How do I continue to make it as usable as I can possibly make it? And how can I address issues as they come up in a rapid manner, right? Because yeah. without those feedback, you could go on for months and think, you know, I've, this is just how my system works. And when in actuality, sure. you could be improving it and kind of fixing it's okay to Whatever get smarter, be, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, just because you build something doesn't mean it can't get better. So. Yeah. 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 So that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned over a couple of like big changes. Are there any smaller things that you mm -hmm. think are maybe minor changes that are going to have a big impact? Let me tell you one more other big change because okay. I, I only got through the baseball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How long do we have? <laughs> um, 
I would say the one other major change I do want to touch on, because it is probably the most major change, is we've added the idea of user-controlled wallets into the guidance. Um, and this kind of harkens to some of the MDL, verifiable credentials, self-sovereign identity, whatever you want to kind of bucket it as um, type conversations we were having earlier. So in the base volume, you know, we have a list of like, here's the cool digital identity models you should be thinking about, federations, CSPs, all those other stuff. We've added a model in there that kind of aligns the practices that we've historically talked about in the guidance with this idea of, uh, of, uh, of a user controlled wallet. Um, and then in 863C, which is our federation document, we've basically laid out the specific requirements for how you present something out of that wallet. We call them attribute bundles. Others will call them credentials. We didn't use credentials because there's some fuzziness in, in how others use that term versus okay. how we use it. But basically, here's how you present something out of a wallet in a secure, reliable, trustworthy manner so that a reliant party can consume it. Whether they're using it for proofing, authentication, doesn't really matter. This is what you have to do in order to present that out. So that's a huge, huge change. We had said in the, the draft previously, hey, you can use these kinds of tools and people were like, how? Um, so we tried to get a, a little bit of the how and a little bit of the protection around the actual exchange of those credentials out of the wallet. So that's another like big, big change, but like little smaller changes as far as like the volume that'll have a big impact. Um, 863B, we have updated the um, account recovery language. One of the biggest complaints we had about 63B was this section is a little confusing. Um, it could be a little bit clearer and it's it's hard to figure out how we can actually do this process as secure as possible. So we've restructured it. It's not like a ton of content. Um, so it's a smaller like volume change, but I think it's going to be pretty impactful um, as far as like we've described the processes a bit more discreetly. We've also opened the door to a few things that we learned about from like the commercial space, things like, you know, potentially setting up a trusted contact that can help you recover your account um, during the identity proofing process or during the account establishment process. Um, there's a number of commercial vendors that allow for that kind of a, a support process. And then we've mapped what kind of account recovery steps can support which levels of assurance so that there's a um, a better balance of knowing, like, I'm not going to use a, a very low assurance um, recovery process for a high assurance mm -hmm. account. So um, I think that's one of the smaller changes um, from a, like a like a volume wise, but it's I think it's going to be I'm very I'm very happy to see how people respond to it because I think uh, I think we've done a pretty good job with the day ads. So. Yeah, you you mentioned the document. So uh, 863 mm -hmm. is in three documents, right? A, four. B, and four documents. Yeah. Okay. So I've only, I'm only familiar with A, B, and C, but maybe yeah. go over what. So we have document. we have the base volume, which is just 863-4, somewhat confusingly, um, and that covers your digital identity model, and it's basically just setting like how are we going to talk about all these concepts for the rest of these volumes, and then it's your risk management process. So how do you assess risk, evaluate risk, understand impacts to your programs, and then put in place the right assurance levels and document those assurance levels, um, and continuously improve now. Then 63A covers the identity proofing process um, for like your commercial folks out there. It's like know your customers. Mm -hmm. Like how do I? How does this person go from someone I have no idea who they are to someone I have enough confidence in their identity to allow them access to an account and issue them a credential? Uh, 63B is the authentication component. So now that I've got confidence in the identity, I can issue them a secret so that they can use it to authenticate in the future. So I don't have to put them into the pain of identity proofing every time they want to access their account. And then 63C is the concept of federation. It covers all of our federation requirements. So how do I share identity information either with someone who's relying on me to do all of the identity proofing and authentication processes, or how do I share it even internally? So things like single sign-on or from one federa or from one part of your organization to another that might not necessarily have the same user directories and stuff like that. So does, but did you ever get to a point where you're like, hmm, maybe that structure is not the right one to go with going forward? Because you brought up the SS... I scenarios, you said you plug those into federation. Was that like the natural place for it? Or did you start to question whether or not there should be a dash D? <laughs> um, uh, so just to be clear, we're, it's not like SSI. It's more of like, if there's something in a wallet, whether that's an SSI credential or MDL or something like that. So just want to make sure that's clear. Okay. Um, but no, I mean, we had a pretty long debate about how to deal with um, wallets and, and I think, I think it makes sense where it is. The team thinks it makes sense where it is. Um, we'll see what 
people think. But at the end of the day, the way we looked at it is the wallet is essentially acting as an identity provider. It's going to provide an assertion to our lying party that says this person is who they claim to be. And here's the evidence for how you do that. Whereas in a traditional model, that's coming from, you know, like a, a server maintained by an organization that's done some kind of a process and you have more of like an organizational connection there. They're probably presenting assertions for a whole bunch of different people. You know, that's that's your traditional IDP. The wallet is basically ask, acting as an IDP where they've pulled in information from the CSP and they're going to present that information out, you know, the issuer, they're going to prevent that, present that information out to the relying party. And a lot of the protocols and techniques are very, very similar to the traditional federation protocols as well, too. So from our perspective, it just, they made the most sense. It's just IDP where, or a uh, federation where the IDPs move to a different location that's in control of the, um, of the end user. Now it does change the trust model a little bit um, from a traditional approach, but we, you know, we hopefully have addressed that in the, in the context that we've laid out. Sure. Yeah. So we've been talking here for a little bit and yeah, well, I want to make sure I can get you back out to the show here. Do you have a favorite identity week moment? Did something happen? Conversation? And I'm I'm here. Here. And it can't be this because obviously this, this is, the, highlight for this is <laughs> the highlight of my identity week. Um, I would say I, the big thing for me is just the side conversations. Like, yeah. I don't have one side conversation that's jumped out so far, but um, just being able to walk around and see all these people that I typically only get to have, you know, Zoom chats with. So the face to face, I think, mm -hmm. is the highlight and the and the connections you get. You to can't make. replicate that online. You, you can't. I mean, there's you can try, but you can't. I, yeah, I mean, and it's the, the spontaneity of it, I think, is the important part. It's like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And sure, sometimes we have plans, but. You know, I think we're probably the same as if we're walking through the hallways and then someone kind of grabs you. Hey, how was it going? Yeah. And those are the, for me, that's, and, that's and why you end I'm up talking this. about some innovation or concept that you weren't, it wasn't even on your radar. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, I'm going to go find a nice quiet place and do research <laughs> for half an hour about what we're talking about here. So I've shared this story before, but it was a, <laughs> I think it was a cup and coal cons, uh, conference that I went to a while back. It was in Seattle and Roger Grimes, um, I, we had had him on the show at some point and I kind of walked over and introduced myself. This is very early on when we started recording and we got into a, I want to say like an hour long conversation about quantum computing about three or four years ago. And that never would have happened in any other context yeah. other than him being kind enough to like answer my newbie questions about, I don't understand this thing. Like, what is it? And he was so kind and gracious with his time there. And that's, I think that's kind of like the spirit of the conference. Any yeah. time where you go to is having those hallway conversations. Yeah. I, and I think that's what I like about this is, is because I get those chances and those mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, unfortunately, yesterday, outside of my session, I was a little bit hijacked by a couple of other work items that needed to be taken care of. But I'm excited today because I have an opportunity to go to much more things. So. Mm -hmm. I have one more question for you. So a lot of the folks who listen to a podcast are new to the industry and just learning about identity. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the fundamental concepts in 863, and you referred to it a few times, is this level of assurance framework. So could you just kind of give an introductory level explanation of what that's all about? Yeah. So we have essentially what we do within the risk management process is we, we, we kind of start with like, look, let's assess the application. Let's understand what the impacts of would be of what, what if there is a failure here? Mm -hmm. What if someone got access who shouldn't get access, right? And that allows you to understand, is this going to be a high risk application, moderate list risk application, or low risk application? But what do you do with that? Okay, I've got all that. Well, we've established to be able to help provide an initial, initial baseline, baseline of what, what should, should I be, I be doing, doing, the assurance levels. And the assurance levels are broken into three different parts. We have identity assurance. How much confidence do I have in the initial identity? Authentication assurance. How much confidence do I have that this person is the person originally enrolled and registered, um, and that they're presenting an authenticator that I trust? And the federation assurance level. So, how much confidence do I have in an identity that's being asserted to me through some kind of a federation scenario? Uh, and so, you'll go through, and then you'll be able to say, "Look, all right, if I'm at low, moderate, or high, I'm going to pick. I, I, I'm going to start with this assurance level, this assurance level, and this assurance level. And each one of those is targeted towards kind of like a, a risk pattern, right? Like our IL-1, which is a little bit different now than it was in 63.3, um, you know, is like, hey, it's just let's let's deal with the big scalable attacks 
the ones that are kind of low hanging fruit and make sure you've got some baseline controls that support, you know, stopping that 80% of, of, of bad guys. Then you start to move on to IL2 and you realize, all right, we need to have a bit more confidence in who this identity is. So you're adding a bit more um, from an evidence perspective. I need more evidence of who you are. You've got a more stringent validation process. You've got a, a stricter verification process to make sure that, you know, the person sitting on the other end of that laptop is actually the person who that they are, who they are claiming to be and who is in possession of that evidence. So we, we essentially have buckets of controls that we're trying to deal with and buckets of risk we're trying to address with each one of those assurance levels, but they're only baselines, right? They're intended to be a starting point because you might find IL2 works great for most of your controls, but or most of your threats, but you might have a very specific threat in your organization or to your process that you want to address. We're not saying don't add controls. We're not saying don't take controls away. We're saying start here and then document a process of tailoring to meet your specific needs from that point. And that gives everyone an understanding of what are we all starting from to talk about from a, like an interoperability perspective. And it also gives you a point to go back to and say, this is where we had to make some changes in order to fit our organizational perspective. Like our authentication assurance level is a great example of that is AL2. Like we have a lot of different authentication options that you can, you can select from going from like, you know, a SMS OTP, which we don't like, but we right. have to maintain for, for specific still reasons. Still better than nothing, right? Still better than nothing, exactly. And you might have users who don't have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. That's the case. They don't have many other options for multi-factor authentication, all the way up to a hardware key. You might make a decision based upon your user population. I'm not going to accept the risk of using SMS OTP. That is perfectly fine. That is just one option at that uh, authentication assurance level. So you can adapt from there what is specifically important to you within those insurance levels. Um, so AL1, a short level one is like username and password in 63-3. And for AL2 is uh, username and password plus an MFA. And a short level three is stronger MFA. Blood yeah. sample, genetic sample. <laughs> you have to actually sacrifice a child. It's, it's, it gets really wild. Wait, wait, be careful what you say. Yeah. You know, <laughs> people might take that as yeah. you know, the law. No. So, so, so the, the big thing that the big distinctions we have at this point are single factor authentication, typically username and password, multi-factor authentication, and that can range at IL, at AL2, and that can range from again, SMS OTP all the way up to, you know, your hardest of hardware cryptographic authenticators. When you get to IL or AL3, we're talking about phishing resistance and we're talking about um, non-exportability of, of cryptographic keys. So you're really at that point talking about um, very strong um, either platform-based authentication or hardware-based authentication where you have a high assurance that that, that key hasn't left and it's not going to be phished. So in practice, you know, that's going to be something like a, like a FIDO token, hardware FIDO token, a platform authenticator um, mm -hmm. that can't be exported or something like a PIV card that, you know, you have as a federal government employee. Do those change in Dash 4? No. The, so the only thing that's really changed in Dash 4 um, along those lines is at AAL2, we allow for exportability. So back in Dash 3, you could not do that. Um, but what we've seen is kind of this expansion of this idea of, we call them syncable authenticators in the guidance because passkey is kind of a borderline like copyright. It might even actually be copyrighted. Um, but basically this idea of, of you can have a phishing resistant authenticator that is way better than using like something like SMS OTP but it's not the same level of assurance as something like an AL3 authenticator. So we do allow for that. We've got, we wrote a, a supplement to 863.3 in April um, that basically said you can start to use these things under certain conditions. Um, we've added all that content in. So we, we've created a space for essentially, we'll say the passkey pass world um, at AL2 in order to support multi-factor authentication and, and in particular phishing resistant. A lot of folks are looking at this at how do I apply this level of insurance framework for a my government to citizen scenario mm -hmm. or my business to consumer scenario? But I think AL3 almost sounds like that would apply more in my internal workforce. Like yeah. when I start to get to, you know, administrators or privileged access. Yeah, you could you could conceive of use cases where AL3 might make sense for certain mission partner type use cases where, you know, if you've got a partner organization that also has, you know, like if you're in the federal government, you've got a partner organizations that have also got PIV cards, 
Mm-hmm. You're not going to do a lower level of authentication just because they're not part of your organization. Um, you could also conceive of very small scenarios where you might issue people something like a PIV card or a hardware authenticator because they have some kind of elevated um, uh, uh, role um, in information sharing or something like that. But for the most part, yeah, like your your public facing applications are probably going to fall into AL2 in most instances. Um, particularly if there's anything sensitive that those applications are protecting, but it not, it would be, we're not, we're not telling you to go out and issue the general public EB keys or, or FIDO tokens or something like that. Now you can allow it if you've got one, but we're not, we're not asking you know, agencies to go out and start boring. Here's your social security number and here's your hardware token. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we need to do something about <laughs> issuance. I'm, I'm not saying that we should be doing that. Yeah. I mean, it, w- one of the big problems we have in the country is that, like, you know, there's not a, ultimately a lot of our, our core identity is tied back to very simple documents like birth certificates that are not hard to <laughs> falsify. So doing better at that early level is going to be really important. Obviously not issuing people <laughs> FIDO tokens at, at that level, um, but maybe doing something that's a little bit more cryptographic. I'm still viable. thinking yesterday of the future of identity, right? Yeah. Like right. the Star Trek can that yeah. knows who I am. And, and, the, and there, is, there is good work being done by a lot of organizations in that like breeder document space of how can we start to have more confidence in those, in those core documents, like at the earliest phases of our, our existence really. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else? Later or no, later now, uh, before I hit record. Uh, you were talking about some existential questions that you had recently imposed. Let's talk real quickly about that. Explain the scenario for people who weren't in the room with us. Yeah. So, so my son, uh, he's five years old. Um, and we were, we were talking about how, like, you know, what, you know, what phases of life with the kids we, we like the best. I also have a daughter who's one and she's just getting close to standing and walking. So that's about to get even scarier. Um, but my five-year-old, like I, we were talking about how I, th- I think five might be my favorite age so far. Cause like when they're like, like four years old, they start to ask a lot of questions, but very basic questions like, why, you know, why, 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 why? And you're like, because, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> because. Every parent out there probably knows the yeah. best answer. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And, and, the, but you know, my son has really started to ask these really well thought out, carefully crafted thoughtful questions. Um, he's been reading the NIST documents behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I hope not. Um, but he, uh, we were driving the, I was taking him, taking him home from school a couple of days ago and he was really quiet. He was just staring out the window. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, he, he looks at me in the front seat and he says, dad, what if nothing existed? What if there were no planets or people or trees or grass? I don't know why grass and trees got involved, but I was like, I don't even know how to Five answer years old. this. I, I don't even know. I was, I was a little worried uh, because of how existential it was, but I, I had no idea how to answer the question. I, I was like, I think I ended up diverting on to like, hey, did you see the sign for the new Wendy's that they're putting in across the street or something Frosties. like that? Yeah, yeah Frosties. <laughs> and, and he was like, you're avoiding my question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, he just asks these super interesting, super fun questions. Um, I'm a big history podcast guy so he's we listen we listen to a podcast about um like uh bronze age culture and there's this whole concept of like the sea peoples and he's like i don't understand this you're gonna have to explain this to me in much more detail and i'm like what? <laughs> dude i've been on my desk by tomorrow yeah at 9 yeah i'm like I, I don't know just just enjoy the podcast and listen so yeah you have a doogie howls around your hands that, yeah i mean he's he seems very intellectually curious we'll put it that way you know Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Did anyone get some eye improved by any chance? No, I'm sorry. We're in the middle of a recording. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> On a lighter note. All right. So we are at a conference, just yeah. FYI. <laughs> yeah. We, we weren't faking this. Yeah, exactly. This is not a deep fake. Yeah. Do you get any accidental questions from your kids? Uh, I'm sure I did. They're all teenagers now, so it's kind of hard yeah. to, to bring myself back to specific questions, but I do remember thinking about questions like one that Ryan mentioned earlier. It's like, why don't we all just float away? And I was like, yeah, I remember getting questions like that. Yeah. And the challenge is what is, what level do you explain gravity at? Yeah. Do you just say it's because of gravity? And yeah. some kids will just say, oh, gravity. Okay. 
That makes sense. I don't that know what it sense, is, but right? okay. But then it's, okay, well, how does gravity work? Yeah. We have the planet spinning and it's pulling everything towards, here's a Neil okay. deGrasse Tyson video. Watch that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he does yeah. a wonderful job of describing those things. He makes things fun. Yeah. 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 Gravi- gravity was a fun one. I don't remember how, I think my wife got that question um, and I got to hear about how she explained the answer, but yeah. she's a, my wife is huge into um, space and astronauts and stuff like that, so. We were driving home the other day, and, and my brother, my, my my son said, um, "You know, you're not very good at answering the space questions. Mom's much better at answering the space questions." I'm like, yes, this is. Oh, which is very like true. High school mathematics, and the kids are needing help with homework, and you're like, "Man, I know I knew how to do this at one time, but my ninth grader probably knows it better than I do yeah. now." And this isn't going to like hearing this, but I'm actually worried about like the middle school math. I'm not even worried about the high school <laughs> math. Yeah, yeah. As long as you number sequentially, that's probably all that matters, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up uh, for this episode. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for coming back. Yes, my pleasure. Time with us. I fun. know you're in demand. Say, oh, the NIST guy's here. We've got to go talk to him. The uh, NIST. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, I'll have links in our show notes for awesome. people to connect with you on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll put the most recent versions of the publications out there so people can check that out. Fantastic. Um, you can follow us on a LinkedIn. lot of different things. Twitter, X, whatever it's called YouTube. these days, YouTube, um, all kinds of stuff. So visit idacpodcast.com. You'll see all of our links up there. And uh, yeah, like and subscribe, share with others. I uh, want to give a shout out to Anthony, who walked up yesterday to us after my panel and says mm-hmm. we're cool. himself. So always great to, to see and hear from people uh, who you know enjoy the show. Uh, even if you don't enjoy the show, come up and tell us what's wrong with it. We're happy to take that. <laughs> yeah, that. Anthony's feedback was really cool, too. He's, you know, he... He said he really likes how we ask people, how did you get into identity? Mm-hmm. His story was that he was in identity for a couple of years. And then when he went to change jobs, he realized, oh, I was in identity. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to, <laughs> and now I'm going to apply for identity jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very cool. So, all right, let's go ahead and leave it there for this week. Thanks everyone for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with y'all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.